I don't normally like to put so much text up, but I think that the original definition of open access is actually a, a pretty informative piece of writing. So in 2002, a number of uh, publishers, researchers, and other you know, people interested in the communication process, they met in Budapest, and they um, got down to defining what, what they wanted open access to be. So I've got a couple of quotes. Um, the definition of open access is free avail availability on the public internet, permitting any user to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, or link to the full text of articles, crawl them for indexing, pass them as data to software, or use them for any other lawful purpose without financial, legal, or technical barriers other than those inseparable from gaining access to the internet itself. So I think that this is an important moment to define open access as being broader than simply being free to read. So a number of things can contain, uh, can be free for you to read. If you pick a book out of a library, uh, of course you, you can take it home with you and read it. A uh, number of websites, things are free. The idea behind the open access movement was to broaden the use of the work itself, and meaning that you couldn't, you didn't just have the ability to read it, but you could distribute it. You could do something else with it, uh, share it in your classroom, build off of it in other lawful ways. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the licenses that open access uses and how those are different from traditional copyright today as well. The only constraint on reproduction and distribution and the only role for copyright in this domain should be to give authors control over the integrity of their work and the right to be properly acknowledged and cited. So it is important to note that even as the, the rights of a reader or user or consumer of content were expanded, the rights of the authors are still there. And the idea is that by expanding the reach of your work, you can positively impact more people, but you should always be acknowledged and cited as the original author of that material. And that is still something that should always be done, no matter where you're publishing your papers, uh, no matter what format you're using. Okay, so now that we've got the history down, I, I want to spend a little more time diving into what we actually know about open access publishing. So different, different types of open access, different types of journals and publishers, um, some of the data we have about the costs, the uh, number of journals, things like that. And then to talk to you about a few of the myths that we've encountered and a number of others have as well about open access and what, what the truth is behind them. So first I think it's important to note that, and this still causes some confusion in the field for sure, there are a couple of different varieties or flavors, or in this case, colors of open access that are, are being used in different ways. So I wanted to find two of those here, and uh, that'll help our, our discussions as we go forward. So green open access, if you hear anyone use that term, refers specifically to taking a copy of your work, and we'll discuss the different formats it could be, Typically, this is the final accepted manuscript, but not the one that's been copy edited and typeset to look, look beautiful like the journal is going to make it. So your, your post print. Taking that and putting it then in a repository where it's available to anyone. Some examples of these repositories are Archive, they're the digital access to scholarship at Harvard, so individual institutions, or PubMed Central, as I mentioned before. There's another uh, variety of open access called gold. And in this case, the idea behind that is that the author or someone else is paying for the publication. Uh, this is what you might be a little more used to, something like the, the PLOS journals, the BMC journals, Indawi, Frontiers, uh, there's tons I could go on and on, um, or individual standalone journals like, like Peer J, which is an interesting one we can get to if there's time. It is important to note, though, that while gold certainly indicates uh, the idea of financing and purchasing power, it isn't always the author that has to pay. And in some cases, uh, an example was eLife up until next year. Uh, they're going to start charging authors next year. But for the first about three years of the, uh, the existence of eLife, 
all of the publication costs were borne by a few large funding agencies, so the, the Wellcome Trust, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the Max Planck Institute. There are also plenty of journals, uh, around the world especially, that are run by individual institutions. And in many cases, these don't charge authors either. So not only is the, the, are they free to read, but they're free for authors to publish in. And instead, they're, they're housed. They're usually you know, run by volunteer editors. And they're housed on a, like a library server or something like that. Either way, though, that would still fall under gold if, if we're comparing and contrasting these two styles of open access. One being green, that it's being published somehow elsewhere, but a copy of it's being made available, versus gold, where the entire publishing process is open access from start to finish. To view the full video of this and all of our other webinars for bioscientists at the bench, please visit bitesizebio.com slash webinars.